excited to welcome all of you to our first ever Free Markets versus Democratic Socialism debate. We've been wanting to do this debate for a few semesters now, and we were finally able to meet Renee. So we, that's why this debate is happening. There's so many people to thank who put in a lot of hard work in making this debate happen, both from the Young Democratic Socialists of America and Young Americans for Liberty, of which I'm president. I'd especially like to thank Justin Codd and Brendan Mitchell for putting together all the tech stuff. And thank you all for coming. You might be wondering about the pizza. The pizza is coming, the order has screwed up, but it will be here in about a half an hour. We'll pause the debate for that. We got the <laughs> The pizza is coming in about a half an hour. I know you're all wondering about that. There's a link up here if you have questions. So at the end we'll have a question and answer session. If you have questions, type in that link, but it will also be emailed to you in your email. We have your email because you all signed in. And then at the end of the debate, you'll receive a post-event survey. And this is where you can give us feedback. It's really helpful to us if you fill it out. It lets us know how the debaters did, how the moderators did, how you like the format, and all those sorts of things. Test, test. And a, just hold it. And a big thank you also to our moderators, Dr. John Wright from the Criminal Justice Department here at UC, and Daniel Merrill, who is an organizer with the Democratic Socialists in Northern Kentucky and Cincinnati. And so without further ado, let's get started. Statements. Yeah. Oh, I'm opening with my statement. Your statement. I'll just start speaking. Yeah. America is the number one country when it comes to income inequality. 51% of the people earn less than $30,000 a year. Most of them can't afford a $500 emergency. Things are not bad for uh, not this bad for everyone. In fact. For the people at the top of American society, life has never been so good. Even as incomes have stagnated for the vast majority, the richest 10% have gotten richer and fatter. Any decent person would agree that there is something fundamentally wrong with the system. You'll often hear two explanations for that. The first one blames the individual. If you do not have a job, if you're not rich, blame yourself. The second explanation blames the government. The basic idea is that social problems arise because the government keeps interfering with the market. If left to itself, the market is both fairly fair and maximally efficient. Therefore, the solution is to get the government out of the economy and let the markets do its magic. It's easy to see the, uh, that this is the view from the mansion. It's the ideology of the winners for whom the system has worked fantastically. People are not buying this hot shit anymore. The signs are everywhere. A poll recently showed that 55% of millennials have a positive view of socialism. Universal health care polls at 70% nationally, with 52% support in Republicans. Free public college polls at 60% nationally, with 41% approval from Republicans. And before you label me as a communist and upload this video on Facebook saying communist snowflake gets wrecked by logic, I agree that nothing is free. It's, it's our taxpayer money, and that's what we want at the end of the day. Socialism is not a political opinion. It's how things should have worked all along. It's the natural choice of the people under a brutal capitalist state. And that's what democratic socialism means to me, taking back what was always asked to begin with. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Garrett Sinmeyer, and I'm uh, going to be representing the Young Americans for Liberty today. Um, I would like to extend my thanks to uh, Vinay for agreeing to this debate and to all of you uh, for coming out here. Uh, and it is really important that we discuss these issues because statistics can lie to you. And even statements like a lot of the ones that he just made can sound really good on its face. 
America is number one country in the world for income inequality. That tends to happen when you're massively the most rich country in the history of the world. It's just a reality. We have the richest poor in the history of the world. So that matters far more as to what their standard of living is than income inequality. Uh, but the reality is, is that there's already a country that's tried out this grand experiment. Uh, it's Sweden of the 70s and the 80s. They had marginal tax rates that even eclipsed 100%, 102%, 123%, to where it actually costs people more to make more money. The result is, is that even with those enormous marginal tax rates, they didn't have enough money to fund their welfare systems. Since the 90s, Sweden has been privatizing our version of Social Security, their benefits system. They've privatized their rail network and their utilities, sold government-owned businesses like Absolute that used to be owned by uh, the government. Over 50% of their high schools are now private, and the public schools around those private schools have gotten better over time. And the reality is, is that the idea that you are taking back something that has always been yours is a, a fallacy. It was not yours. You have not invested the risk or your own time and money that is valuable in order to create the richest nation in history that we currently have in America. And capitalism has also brought more of the world out of poverty, whereas socialism just is racking up a body count. So uh, I, I look forward to uh, going over each of these individual topics uh, in further detail. Thank you for the question, Professor. So uh, let's start. Uh, the professor said that some socialist countries have limits on education, and you know they have uh, limits as to how much you can, uh, how long you can be in school. But let me dispel the myth that any country is actually a socialist state in the world right now. There exists no pure socialist state in, uh, uh, throughout the world anywhere. Venezuela is not a socialist state. Cuba is not a socialist state. Sweden is a social democracy. It comes cl the closest to a socialist state, but there, uh, uh, nothing exists such as an actual socialist state. And when you say people never make an effort as to educate their own public, then I think it comes down to the laws that, uh, uh, that are written in, in these countries. Uh, ultimately, the power rests within the people who you elect to represent yourself. So it's very much important that you elect people who will make sure that there's a robust education policy, there's a uh, reform of the curriculum that's been taught uh, at schools, and they basically have the welfare of the country in mind, and not people like Betsy DeVos. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I, I find the, the comment that there is no socialist country currently in the United States uh, such an ar arrogant take. Uh, that means that you have a better solution than Maduro, Chavez, uh, Ma Mao, Stalin, Lenin. All of these guys can't get it right, but you magically can. That's, that's, that's quite a statement. Uh, but the fact is, is that we do have socialist countries, and uh, socialism is simply a public uh, ownership of the means of production. And every time that you have seen that done, whether in individual industries or in entire countries, it ends up failing rather quickly. Um, and the idea that for uh, socialism to work, you just have to elect the great representative, then what we're essentially doing is we're adopting the paternalistic view of slavery, except you are enslaving yourself by the vote. 
for somebody to have complete and utter control over your life. I like to think that as adults on a college campus that you guys have the ability to make your own decisions and that we don't need to treat you as stupid and inferior if you're not part of the ruling class. First of all, uh, there's a difference between a dictator calling himself socialist to gain power and versus him actually being socialist. So when you say that you rest your power within the, your elected government, or your elected officials to decide on your behalf, how's that, uh, how's that slavery? Like it's, it's, it's called democracy. It's how you make sure that your views are represented. It's, it's also up to you to challenge your representative when they're not following through the uh, promises that they gave you before you voted them. So it's not just about uh, electing a person in office. It's not about Bernie Sanders getting elected to the office either. It's about people realizing that the real power is within them and them making sure that they hold their representatives accountable. So it's, it's much more of a revolution than just electing a, so, uh, a person who, uh, you know, panders to the democratic socialist base. When Kamala Harris calls, calls herself a progressive, I don't want to believe her because I know her history. So it's up to you to elect people who have a consistent record on education and basically will fulfill the promises that they have uh, promised. Thank you. The distinction is not whether or not you vote for the representative, but the amount of power that they have over your life. Do we want to elect leaders or do we want to elect rulers? You know, 200 years ago, uh, plus years ago, we threw off the last ruler that uh, existed in the United States uh, because we were built on the idea that individuals have the freedom and liberty to make their own decisions. Uh, but to focus more back on the original question, um, it is true that uh, communist dictatorships and uh, socialist countries uh, alike uh, either specifically educate only a, a certain portion of the population or they hyper-focus on a specific part, such as Cuba was actually able to eclipse the United States in terms of the number of individuals in the country that could read, but they could do very little else because the country can only focus and specialize on one thing. Whereas, as I pointed to Sweden, they had complete government public education, uh, K through 12, uh, as recently as the 1980s, and now when they entered into a complete school choice voucher system, which is what many on the right are now advocating as a stepping stone towards the free market, they now have over 50% of their high schools who are uh, private, they outperform the public schools, and public schools who are in closer relation to the private schools in the area due to competition have performed better. Can I have a comment? Can I, can I go again? Yeah. So the real question is uh, not uh, that public schools are failing and private schools do better. Why do public schools fail? The, if you look into how public schools are funded in America, it's primarily because of the property taxes around that public school. So if you, if you are in a poor neighborhood, then you're destined to go, uh, go to a, poor, uh, a public school that doesn't receive enough funding. So if you're from a rich neighborhood, your property taxes ca take care of the uh, private school that, uh, that's in your neighborhood. So it's, it's this perpetual cycle that if you're born poor, then you're almost destined to be poor. So I think we need to question as to how we uh, fund our public schools rather than just labeling them as failures and uh, you know, uh, advocating for a private school system. Thank you. Um, the moderator just wanted to mention to make sure that we stay on the topic of whatever is in the question that's currently on the board. It's just to be sure. Um, here, question I have for you. Student loan debt has grown to over one and a half trillion dollars. While finding a steady job has proven more and more difficult for recent college graduates, leaving a whole generation unable to achieve what used to be standard lifetime goals. Given this, how can we justify a profit education system? The fact is, is that you need a for-profit education system that doesn't have the government massively involved in it. Uh, pretty much any industry that is told that there will be unlimited amounts of loan money provided to the people who want to purchase that, uh, prices are going to rise. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if you look at the schools that don't take any federal funding, which there's only two uh, United States colleges that take absolutely zero dollars of federal funding, 
they seem to have no issues whatsoever in terms of keeping their prices low because they aren't sucked into the competition that all the other schools are. Um, to give you an idea of, uh, it's not just the uh, college loan debt either, it's the high school. Uh, so how many of you remember being taught in high school how a credit card works, how a mortgage works, how to balance a checkbook, basic financial literacy? None of that, uh, maybe a few. I, I would wager you went to private high schools too. If you, were, if you were taught that. Uh, but we're focused on having children read Shakespeare and stuff. So it started when you had high schools uh, misallocating what they're supposed to be teaching individuals. They're supposed to be preparing you for life as an adult. College is supposed to be an option if you want to specialize in something. And another important thing is, is that when the government provides student loans regardless of what you're going to school for, you get the idea that it's a great idea to graduate with really trash degrees that aren't worth anything in the open market. A college degree certifies that you are good at following directions. Nothing else if it doesn't have a degree of specialty that people want to pay you for. No, you make a good point about the curriculum that's being taught in public schools and public colleges. I, I believe that there needs to be an overhaul of the things that we focus on in school, not uh, not just uh, entrance tests and uh, uh, not just entrance tests and uh, getting your GPA high, but if you are actually equipped with the skills to deal with the real world. So th that's a fair point right there. But uh, when you look at public colleges today, they function more like corporations than uh, edu uh, institutions that are sub supposed to educate the public. They have endowment funds that they invest in other companies for returns, uh, uh, for return and investment. We've, the public school system has uh, gives off vouchers to uh, private school systems to leech off public money. So it's this, it's it's the whole system that's to be uh, uh, blamed when it comes to uh, public school. And I imagine who be who benefits from an educated population. It's all of us. It's you get to live in an educated society if everyone has the right to go to a free college. And the solution is not for everyone to opt for a STEM degree. If your free market actually offers a variety of choice, then why can't I choose a trash degree if I like it? Uh, I wouldn't just say that it's uh, you know all non-STEM degrees that are going massively downhill. Um, when you have a congresswoman who can claim to have a degree in economics and make some of the statements that she's made on national television, I would heavily question the ability of colleges to properly educate our youth. Uh, but to go back to it, so the idea that public schools are a good uh, idea is not the idea that we don't think that everyone should be educated. Trust me, it's in my uh, best interest to not be surrounded by idiots when your votes count just as much as mine. Uh, but the idea that uh, public schooling is a good job is that education is important. Well, food is really important too. So why don't we have the government set up 50,000 grocery stores across the United States You'll be assigned one based on uh, you know, the one that lives closest to you. When you show up, you'll get a uh, cart full of goods. You don't get to go through and pick. Uh, if you don't like what's in your cart, you can have a say. Talk to your local food council, and the food lobby will have their say too. And everyone who works there will be promoted by tenure, not by innovativeness or customer service. Who wants to go to that grocery store? I want to go to Kroger. <laughs> well, you're right. Food is a human right. I think you're getting the gist of socialism, Garrett. Food is a human right. Water is a human right. Education and healthcare are human rights. So uh, for you to say that uh, uh, privatizing education would solve the problem is actually counterintuitive. Private, uh, a private uh, education system would make sure that not uh, people who can't afford an education would not get an education in, uh, in a private uh, education system. So it's, it's the public education system that makes sure that the uh, People who cannot afford to go to college but really want to learn are willing to, uh, the people who are willing to put in the work actually get through it, actually have a fair shot at life, actually have an even playing field uh, if, if your father doesn't earn $150,000, $200,000 a year to be able to afford private education for you. Uh, 
I cannot fully explain to you uh, all of the things in, that happens in truly uh, private education systems. So for anyone who's interested, you can Google education without the state. Uh, there's several countries in Africa and in the Middle East that have no government education system whatsoever, a completely private system, and an unspeakable number of people from all walks of life are able to get perfect access to that without an issue. Um, and uh, again, we're seeing the stark contrast between socialism and uh, free markets. Uh, in socialism, you have to demand that something is a human right and then wait in a line for it. Uh, in uh, free market capitalism, we're not concerned with the fact that it's your right, it's that I'm going to provide it to you. No, in no capitalist countries are there bread lines or you know, issues with water. Uh, happens frequently in socialist countries. In fact, the man Bernie Sanders thinks waiting in line for bread is a good thing. <laughs> mentioned free education, um, I kind of thought that might be an issue. So I looked up UC's budget office and how much it costs per day uh, to operate UC. This is for all services and contracts, public safety, lights on, the water quality, have people in a classroom, what have you. Um, in fiscal year uh, 2017, it's about $1.2 billion a year. In other words, it's about $3.3 million per day to operate UC for one institution and a state in the state of Ohio. So if we ever made college free in the state of Ohio, how would we afford it? Well, uh, this gets back to the old debate that we don't have enough money to, uh, you know, go around in this country. But if you look at the recent tax cuts that Trump gave to his billionaire friends, then we lost $2 trillion in a time span of 10 years for just that. You could end the public uh, uh, student debt crisis with the amount of money that you give to your rich friends. And when you talk about UC's operating funds, well, uh, UC spends a heck lot of money in its athletics department. We pay millions of dollars for our football coaches. Why, 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 why is my tuition money going to a football coach when I came here to study? Why do I care about a new stadium or a new fancy building in, at UC? If you look at the building opposite to the UC rec center, it's the new business college. I'm a business college student. Nothing's wrong with my uh, building at all. It's perfectly fine. So it's, it's just, again, the mentality of uh, the university to attract more uh, rich students to its, uh, to its university to beef up, uh, beef up its public image. So it's functioning more like a corporation now than an educational institution. You asked why all of the, those things are uh, happening. Welcome to socialism. It's not your individual choice, but it's a one-size-fits-all package for everyone who comes here. That's exactly what socialism is, so you're complaining very much about this exact system that you want to instill. Uh, for, for those of you who haven't already been out in, into the workforce and uh, living on your own, uh, I challenge you to find how much it would cost you to sign up to a gym that has full workout room, track, uh, lazy river, hot tub, uh, how many Olympic-sized swimming pools. So. Your standard of living uh, is not that of a college student. It's the standard of living of a college student at a retirement home. So that, that is why you guys are paying retirement home prices to go to school on a yearly basis. Uh, we also have, I'm sure, a list of a litany of deans, uh, one for to decide that there's uh, you know, enough trees on campus and one to make sure that all the walkways are, you know, we, the administrative budget for UC is far above what the actual professors are here. So you have administrators making sure how you're going to live your life and if everybody's comfortable on campus rather than focused on education. Um, we are at the time for this topic. All right. Okay. Wait, I, I need just 30 seconds to finish my comment. So you said that we, have, uh, we live at the standard. We don't live at the standard of a typical college student, but would you trade off like four years of a lazy river that you never use, uh, uh, state-of-the-art gym equipment that none of you here uh, probably use on a regular basis, to, to, to take on this whole student uh, debt burden for the rest of your life? Are you willing to afford to go into debt for $60,000? just because you wanted a lazy river, I think it's a matter of your priorities. And uh, when I come to an educational institution, I do not want a lazy river or a state-of-the-art equipment at a gym. 
I want my education, and that's, that's where the focus needs to be. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and open up the topic of culture. Um, here. People in the U.S. routinely don't go to the doctor for concerning pains, illnesses, or injuries because they're worried about the bill they'll have to pay, meaning preventative care suffers more in the United States. How do we justify keeping our populace sick in the interest of profit? Well, I wouldn't say that the, uh, uh, it's quite an accusation that physicians just want to keep people sick. Uh, you know, as somebody who wants to go to medical school, uh, I can assure you that I'm getting into that field uh, solely because I want to help people uh, get better and live uh, longer, healthier lives. Uh, but that is correct. About 85% uh, or, I'm sorry, 47% of Americans uh, say that they, you know, will only rely on uh, the emergency room or the hospital for their medical care because that's all that they currently have available to them. Um, but this is an issue of the, the government as it has stepped more and more into healthcare, this has become a problem. Uh, if you go back to the 1960s before Medicare and Medicaid were actually instituted, uh, we spent in today's dollars about $146 a person. That's 5% of our uh, GDP and 4% of the average income on healthcare. Um, in 2017, it was 18% of our GDP. Uh, almost 10% of our income, and over $10,000 a person. Uh, soon as Medicare and Medicaid were instituted in 1965, that set off 19 consecutive years of healthcare prices rising by over 10%. That had not happened for two decades until Medicare and Medicaid were instituted. When you bring the government in and make it the largest purchaser of a product, prices are going to rise. Happens in everything. Well, you did not answer the fundamental question as to why our healthcare should be a profit center for a corporation. Like, your health is a, uh, your, your ill health is a moment in your life where you're the most vulnerable at. So if you leave it up to the free market system and you wanna uh, make the argument that you have the choice to go to the best doctor, you have the choice to negotiate your prices, then imagine yourself, you're having a heart attack or you're really sick. Are you in the mood to go to the doctor and negotiate the prices? Are you in the mood to find out which doctor is the best in your uh, neighborhood? Do you, have the, do you even have the knowledge to find out uh, the specifics of which doctor would actually treat you well or not? You don't have all of this. So, a socialist, a free healthcare system would make sure that none of this red tape exists while cutting costs. Uh, uh, according to estimates, we would save any, anywhere between two, uh, two trillion to five trillion dollars. So if you wanna talk about efficiency and making sure that the interests of the people are taken care, then public healthcare system is the way to go. Public health care systems uh, might seem like a great idea, um, but and as Vinay noted earlier, a uh, large percentage of uh, you know, current uh, Americans and even uh, self-identified Republicans support uh, some form of single payer. The issue happens when 47% of those same Americans think that they will be able to keep their current health insurance plan uh, under a single payer system. So the, the issue isn't so much what Americans support, they fundamentally misunderstand what a single payer system is. Uh, but let's take a look at a single-payer system. We got one right to the north in Canada. Uh, two times as often extended wait period to see a specialist. Uh, four times uh, as many people then in the United States will wait more than four months for an emergency surgery. And the big issue is you asked why should uh, health care be a uh, for-profit motive. If you want the best. Uh, saying that America is number one in health care outcomes in the world is like saying we're number one in defense spending, meaning we swamp two through 15. Uh, of the 3,000 scholarly articles that come out in biomedical journals every year, over 40% are from the US. Of the 296,000 clinical trials that are currently being running in the world, 118,000 are in the United States. That's more than Europe and China combined. If you bring us to single-payer healthcare system, you will not only ruin the health results of the United States, but of the entire world who depends on our healthcare system for their own. If you really want to test whether a public healthcare system works, why don't you go to Norway, Sweden, Canada, and ask them if they want to switch to private healthcare? I'll leave YDSA and I'll join Yale if at least 
10 to 20 percent of the people agree to it. It's, it's not the case that you uh, necessarily get the best care when you have a private health care system. If I throw thousands of dollars at a doctor, you bet your ass that I would need best care from him. So it's not about getting the, uh, it's not just about getting the best quality of healthcare. It's also about accessibility and affordability. Are you able to pay for the doctor? Are you able to pay into a private health uh, healthcare insurance system? The answer for a majority of the Americans is not. A majority of the GoFundMe pages that are created today are to cut healthcare cost. If you are a person who's been diagnosed with cancer, you're sure to use, lose all of your life saving within two years. So tell me how the private healthcare system worked for us again. The private healthcare system works the way that it's supposed to until the government comes in and becomes a major purchaser of health insurance. Again, as I said, Medicare and Medicaid caused uh, prices to rise exponentially. Uh, by right now, Medicare and Medicaid are 19% of the budget. By 2020, it will be over 25%, and by 2030, it will be bankrupt. And the current taxes that we have will only cover 48% of it. That is the Medicare and Medicaid that we have right now, not even a Medicare Medicaid for all. Um, you said if uh, people in Canada don't want to leave, uh, 60,000 people per year from Canada come to uh, the United States in order to get uh, care that is far superior. We're number one in the world. Canada is that why Rand Paul went to Canada to get a surgery? Uh, to a private, to a private clinic. Publicly uh, funded. And to a private clinic. Uh, also, uh, Canada's seventh in quality uh, compared to us and number one according to the World Health Organization. <laughs> But the most important thing about why you want private over public health care is because the government has a say in your body once there's a single-payer system. I'll be damned if I will have a system where my son can become the next Charlie Gard or Alfie Evans. Or a woman who's you know, slightly less known, but you can definitely hop on YouTube and hear her impassioned plea at 18 years old as she died two years ago in Canada with leukemia waiting for a stem cell transplant. They had a donor. But the public system in Canada can only finance five people per month, and she died at 18 years old in a first world country waiting on the public health care service to save her. Well, first of all, I, I'd like to refute the fact that uh, when you said uh, Medicare uh, spending would expand to 20 to 30 trillion dollars, that's simply not true. Currently, we, we spend around $15 trillion on our uh, current health care system, $5 trillion in co-pays, co that the money that comes out of our, profit, uh, our pockets. So it's the total $20 trillion cost that, uh, that we are incurring as a country. Your, pay, your payroll taxes would go up a little bit, but overall, it would ensure that everyone would have access to health care. Quality doesn't mean anything if you can't afford it. So that's the fundamental promise of a healthcare, uh, public health care system. When you say that if you are sick, you are allowed to go to the doctor, you don't, have, you don't have to wait in lines, you don't have to go through all the red tape, you don't have to go through the uh, private health care system where you find the best available doctor. So when you say that it would cost us more money, a libertarian think tank which was heavily funded by the Koch brothers itself came out with a, uh, came to the conclusion that we would save two trillion dollars on a public health care system. Just explain to me why a libertarian uh, group, uh, a think tank, would actually come up with a study that would suggest uh, that the private, uh, public health care system would actually save us money. Why would they do that? Why did that happen? I don't think Cato's libertarian. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? I don't consider Cato to be a libertarian. Uh, but I mean, what you're advocating for is exactly what has happened in previous years. Every time healthcare costs get a little bit out of control, the government tries to step in and do a little bit more, and it just doesn't work. In 2003 was the last time. We switched to Medicare Part D to cover drugs uh, for seniors. Drug costs triple because triple the patients went on that program. But what happens to everyone who's not on Medicare Part D? All of you guys. Oh, now you guys get stuck paying the same triple price for all of your medications. And he wants to turn around and say, oh, see, it's the evil capitalist that did that. No, it's the government stepping in once again and ruining a perfectly functioning free market system. All that socialized medicine attempts to do is kill your fellow citizens with kindness. You like, uh, there's this idea that uh, the government ruins everything when uh, it interferes with capitalism and the free market. It's just not true. 
the very foundation of the American industrial system was built on the government helping uh, private corporations do genocidal land grabs and uh, their basic foundation was through free slave labor and supplies that they got from the government. So it's fine when you, uh, when you take help from the government, but when it comes for the government to intervene on behalf of the people, then you're not fine with it. That's hypocrisy right there. And it's, not, uh, it's because of the 2003 law which actually prevents from the government from bargaining with pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical companies is the reason why we have uh, drastic drug cost in this country. So it's, it's not about just the government interfering and the uh, drug prices go up. Okay. So I think most people could agree that there's an insurance coverage problem in the U.S., one that previous administrations tried to address. Is this one answer of increasing or expanding insurance coverage, more capitalism, not less? That insurance markets. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the last two lines? Yeah, sure. Is it uh, one of the answers to increasing insurance coverage amongst individuals and families? More capitalism and not less by deregulating some of the insurance markets so that people can purchase health insurance across state lines uh, just like you can purchase insurance for your vehicle that would drive down the increased competition would theoretically drive down prices uh, and better contain costs. Why do we keep an inefficient system when an alternative, one with less regulation, would probably benefit more people? Well, uh, less regulation doesn't necessarily transfer, uh, translate to more affordability and accessibility for the people. It's just for the uh, insurance company to play, uh, play with people and basically make profit off of them. So first of all, I reject the premise that any company should actually interfere uh, while taking uh, with, a, with a person's health care. So I, I do not believe that health care should be a profit center for anyone. It's, it's one of those sensitive times in your life where you need all the help you can. So you're not in a position to go and negotiate prices or you don't, I, I don't wanna uh, go to a different state and buy a new, uh, new insurance plan. Medicare for all would take care of all of that. You can travel across the country and get any kind of health care that you want for free of cost and uh, basically uh, without you having to go through the, all the red tape. So the, uh, uh, advantages of the private healthcare system that you're proposing are, are just a fraction of the advantages that you would get with a public healthcare system. Uh, I could not disagree more. Um, 3.5 trillion is uh, about what we spend on uh, healthcare a, a year uh, in the United States right now. 30% of that is uh, chalked up to regulations and uh, administrative costs. Uh, so uh, we could definitely make healthcare a heck of a lot cheaper if we would deregulate it. Um, also, while you may not individually want uh, to purchase your health insurance from, you know, say, Hawaii, if it's cheaper, I want to, and I don't want you making that call for me that I can. Um, and the basic idea is, is that you, deregulating and turning it into, as uh, the moderator very uh, well noted, like car insurance, is far more efficient. So the basic idea of insurance is that you buy it when you don't need it for a time when you do. But an insurance company is going to try to make a, trans, uh, a profit on every transaction that you actually go to them for. So how much do you think your car insurance would be if, they were if your car insurer was making a slight percentage profit of a transaction on every time you needed new tires, an oil change, new windshield wipers, to refill any of the fluids in your car, to stop at the gas station? My guess is that your insurance coverage would start looking like your healthcare coverage because that's what the government has done to healthcare coverage. Well, uh, when you say remove, uh, let's remove deregulation costs, I say re uh, let's remove the whole private system that's coming in the middle. Let's remove the insurance, let's remove the middlemen, let's remove the red tape that's uh, costing us for, uh, uh, this much money through, through insurance. So why just stop there? Uh, I, I'm ad ad advocating for a complete repeal of the actual need to uh, deregulate the system in, the, uh, in between. And uh, if, you, if you want to buy insurance on top of the free insurance that you're getting in a different state like Hawaii, go ahead, that's your call. If you want to spend more money on your health insurance. But uh, the deal is that when you compare car, car insurance to health insurance, you, you make your health sound very trivial. Your health is not a commodity. 
It's, it's not something you buy off of a store. It's not something you, uh, you want to order. It's, it's not a good. It's, it's a service that, that is essential because without it, you will die. So it's, it's pretty careless for you to compare a car tire with your health uh, for your lung or a kidney. Thank you. Uh, so the two-tiered system that uh, you know, you're, uh, seem to be advocating for is already present in China and in Cuba. Uh, so you know, there's plenty of uh, articles. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think somebody from Vice uh, recently wrote an article on going to China and their experience with the wait times at the public hospitals versus going, walking across the street to the private hospital uh, with no issue whatsoever. And again, if you want a perfect example in the United States already of what a single-payer healthcare system looks like, Look at the VA. All right, they, making up wait times in order or waiting lists in order to justify the fact that they had to ration and could not save everyone. We had the ability. Private system was continuing to save all of these people that the veterans passed away. That is exactly what happens with the government. And this is again leaving out the fact that this has happened many times in 1974. They tried to pass uh, legislation to crack down on insurance companies uh, turning a profit. And uh, again in 1997, all that ended up happening is that you saw a whole bunch of lower uh, profit providers go out of business, which is why we are now so consolidated into the few insurance companies that we have. Deregulation is how we bring back competition and bring back small businesses and small town hospitals. It is. Oh, we're going to take a pizza break. There's pizza. So, the real estate crisis of 2008 was driven in part by the federal government's efforts to compel banks to make loans to individuals who, under conventional standards, may not have qualified. The goal, which was to increase home ownership, was allowable. Yet the regulations created a set of perverse incentives that affected business decisions that eventually led to a prolonged economic recession. In the lesson, one of the lessons to take away from this example, government regulation and market exchanges can set in motion a chain reaction to negative consequences. That, in the end, creates more problems than it solves. Okay. All right, so when you talk about government and intervention in the free market, let me just state by saying that uh, we as YDSA do not agree with any of the previous governments, whether it's Republican or Democrat. For a very long time, we haven't had a government that was actually the true representative of the people's interest. Since the decision in 1976, where Supreme Court gave uh, corporations the right to donate money to political campaigns, our government has been infested by wealthy people and people who have corporate interests in mind instead of the people who actually elected them. So that's where the problem comes in when you talk about a government being insufficient, uh, inefficient. So I partly agree with uh, Garrett and Libertarians where, where they have to blame the government, saying that the previous governments have not set a good precedent for it. So uh, when you talk about the 2008 uh, finan uh, lack of regulations, then it is definitely a matter of corruptions where uh, Citibank officials and uh, basically the big banks bought into the system and made sure that they could play with people's money. Thank you. So um, I, I would uh, give you props for saying that you agree with us that the previous governments have messed it up. Uh, the problem is, is you, you come off sounding like every single socialist dictator that has risen to power saying that they truly support the, the will of the people. So that's, that's not a good uh, track that I want to go down. Um, but the fact is that 2008 was caused, uh, ironically enough, by, uh, I believe, a Republican initiative to make sure that uh, remember when everyone uh, was saying that you know it's a human right to own, be a homeowner, to own a house, and to have a place of shelter. So they decided to make to mandate loans to uh, people with substandard credit ratings. Uh, those are called subprime loans. And when the government got involved in this, all of the big bankers do exact did exactly what big bankers are supposed to do: 
found a way to make as much money off of it as possible. The government was guaranteeing the loans, so they knew that that was a bet that couldn't lose, and they built a bunch of financial derivatives all based around that bet, knowing that they would get bailed out because they were too big to fail. And surprise, surprise, Barack Obama's response with Dodd-Frank was that we made the big banks even bigger, gave them an even larger percentage of control of uh, you know, the amount of uh, equity that's in the market. And so the problem is, is that we need to deregulate and so that we can get back to letting the small town banks do what they're supposed to do. Bureaucrats are not good at business. Businessmen are. Well, you'd, uh, when you say that I speak like a socialist dictator, then I want you to consider the laws that so-called democratic socialists have introduced into public legislation right now. There's a bill in the House right now which guarantees, uh, uh, which makes Election Day a national holiday, which, decree, uh, which basically removes uh, the necessity for you, uh, for you to need a, a photo ID in order to vote. It increases the, it, it facilitates voting. Are these the features of a dictatorship? And when you talk about dictatorships, they usually hold power because they have a great influence uh, a great influence on the military uh, on the military that they have in their country but you know you know uh, get it that socialists are as anti-interventionist as libertarians are so which one is it are we anti-interventionists that don't want to invest in the military or are we dictatorships you, you can't go with either of them both of them thank you I, I would commend uh, YDSA on the fact that they're introducing a national election day. The problem is, is that Democratic Socialists in Congress have also introduced legislation uh, designed to get rid of farting cows and uh, to provide universal health care uh, that 130 Democrats voted for without any plan on how to pay for it. Uh, so the fact is, is that YDSA is not exactly consistent in offering great legislation. And again, the idea is, is that government cannot know what business people can know. The old socialist calculation problem is that prices are how we know where capital is supposed to go and where money is supposed to go, where goods are needed. Socialist countries fail because they don't have these prices. As a matter of fact, in the old USSR, their people used to have to look in American newspapers for what the price of goods were in order as a basis to price what they were going to charge everyone. So the, the idea is, is that socialism is a control of the means that removes your ability to make good individual decisions for yourself. Across such a vast country with people who are so different, with different motives, different goals, and different time preferences, you cannot have a one-size-fits-all goal. And calling something a human right does not change that issue. I'm not surprised that you would equate the Green New Deal with banning farting cows, given that you're a climate change denier, get it? It's, it's ironic that uh, a person who supports capitalism, which happens to be uh, the system that has actually accelerated climate change, wouldn't, uh, would, uh, wouldn't acknowledge the existence of it. When you, what is regulation? Let's define regulation. When you say that there's an intellectual property for a company, a company owns the patent of something, isn't that regulation? So should we be done with uh, those kind of laws as well where you, know, you make a patent available to everyone? That, that's the kind of regulation that benefits your uh, a corporation. So it's, uh, regulations, are fine with co uh, ca uh, regulations are fine with capitalism as long as, it's ben uh, as long as it benefits them. But when it comes to the defense of public, when it comes to uh, them making sure that you take care of externalities like saving the environment, then it's an inconvenience. It's a, it's a cog in the market that will prevent it from running in, uh, efficiently. Uh, what I would say to that is I, I could care less uh, whether or not regulations benefit or harm corporations. Uh, I care that they universally harm consumers. Um, and uh, as far as the climate change, uh, I'm uh, glad that we've gotten to that. Uh, climate change, I'd just likely, uh, like it for it to be a discussion between scientists instead of politicians and, uh, you know, uh, environmentalist groups that don't really have any uh, formal training. Um, and for an idea of how realistic the Green New Deal is, uh, let's take a look at Germany. Um, they did an Energy Wende uh, program. Fifteen years ago, they started it. As of now, they 
uh, can manage maximum output from renewables that everyone is saying that we need to switch to in 12 years or the Earth's going to end. Um, they're only able to do 30% of that. The other 11% is nuclear, and then 51% are still fossil fuels. Germany is actually building more coal power plants to go away from nuclear uh, than uh, renewables. So uh, it's absolutely ridiculous. Also, the idea that we're going to be running out anytime soon. Uh, we have 46% more proven oil reserves than 20 years ago, 50% more proven natural gas reserves than years ago, and H2O water vapor is a bigger... Uh, greenhouse gas than CO2. So we, let's get it back to the science and not just throwing out talking points. So the 97% of the scientific community that agrees that climate change is real is just a myth. Is it just 67 uh, scientists sitting in the United Nations as you previously alluded to? And by the way, Germany is not switching back to coal. It's actually going 100% renewable energy. So if you haven't read the recent headlines, you might want to catch up with it. And it's not about whether you run out of fossil, uh, fossil fuels in the country or you run out of uh, oil reserves. It's about the fact that your usage of it is harmful to our very existence. It's, we are not making a case saying that we, uh, by the way, you will run out of fossil fuels at a time. So it's, w why isn't the free market of ideas support going, uh, uh, opting for renewable energies? Why, why doesn't it support me uh, installing a solar panel on, uh, at my home? Why does it have to be regulated that way? And also when you talk about true informed decisions that the free market facilitates, then uh, I don't know if you've uh, ever switched on a television or uh, gone on YouTube, then you're bombard, uh, there's an entire industry that's making sure that you make the least informed decision by ma uh, influencing your purchasing patterns. There's this marketing industry that bombards you with ads that, uh, uh, that are biased and that, that count on the fact that you do not investigate further. They want to make sure that you use their product even though that might not be the best for you. And when you talk about uh, uh, the free market, it also... Uh, it also isolates you from the uh, society. It doesn't, it, it focuses on the individual. It separates him from, the, uh, from his neighbor as much as possible. That, that's what it thrives on. Thank you. Okay, there's a lot to get there, so let's go one by one. Uh, the 97% of scientists, uh, that was actually a uh, environmental activist that took a random sampling of papers uh, and over 50% of those papers did not take an opinion on climate change. Of the 77 that did, 75 said that human beings are likely causing some trouble. Well, do 75 divided by 77, you'll find 97%. Uh, also, the scientific community does not operate by consensus. Uh, that's the whole point of the scientific method. Um, just because it was the consensus 300 years ago that the Earth was flat does not make it scientifically so. Um, the uh, other idea is, is that, uh, you know, you want us to change over. Right now, 10% of the U.S. Uh, energy is in solar and wind. 63% is in fossil fuels. 23% is in nuclear. Uh, and so the changeover that would have to happen would be massive. I'm all in favor of you installing a uh, solar panel. But I think that even you will still have a natural gas hookup in case there's a cloudy day, uh, given the current uh, energy conversion rates of solar panels. Uh, I am fully in favor of the market being allowed to figure out what is the most cost efficient and people will go to the energy that is the most cost efficient. Right now it is fossil fuels and you are not going to be able to tell these people that they don't have a right to pursue the energy that they need to live their life just because it makes you feel bad. You're a, you're a chemistry student, right, Garrett? You're a chemistry student. Do you, know, do you not know how batteries work? that during a cloudy day we could actually use the uh, energy that we harnessed on sunny days. That's how solar energy works. It's not that it'll, when it starts raining you'll not be able to use electricity anymore. And do you think the Pli uh, Paris Climate Agreement, all these countries coming to a consensus where they agree that uh, climate change is a problem, is because of some random sampling that happened f with a bunch of uh, 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 researchers? Yeah. Oh, that's it, the whole topic. Okay. Yeah, so no, Q&A? No, 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 just, just that question. Oh, just that question? Yeah. Um, okay, going to the next question on regulation. Um, Garrett, businesses like Amazon are able to receive massive public sub subsidies and in turn spend millions of dollars lobbying our politicians while not paying any of their fair share of taxes and treating their workers poorly. 
It seems a blow to our democracy for our elected officials to be told the companies paying them against our interests using our tax money. Given this, should corporations be regulated to prevent electoral meddling? Uh, so I would absolutely agree that uh, any form of public subsidies, subsidies to a corporation is something that we oppose because we oppose subsidies in all forms, regardless of who it's going to. Uh, so that's a perfect example right there. Um, but the question is, is, why does this happen? And the fact is, is as soon as you give legislators the power to regulate commerce, the first thing to be bought and sold will be the legislators. So the idea that if you just put a little bit more regulation and a little bit more government intervention into the market, that it'll all work out beautifully, you're the alcoholic who's switching from beer to liquor in hopes of getting sober. <laughs> Well, let's be clear what we talk about when we don't want uh, uh, corporations to interfere with our legislation. We're not talking about just switching from uh, uh, vodka to beer or uh, anything. We're talking about a complete, uh, a complete ban on corporations actually uh, donating any amount of money to our politicians. That would make sure that people who are actually have people who are, have the interests of the public in mind, people who are actually able to fundraise money on their own, people who have traction with the public ideas actually get elected into the legislative bodies. So for, uh, for you to say that just because a previous government messed up, you have to upend the old whole system doesn't make much sense. I would contend that it's not that the government messed up, it's the natural progression of government involvement in uh, a situation. Uh, the fact that Amazon is able to use uh, its current standing in order to buy politicians who will in turn buy your vote. The, the, the core issue with socialism or even our current state because we the United States is already pretty darn socialist, for those of you that don't know. Uh, seven or eight of the ten planks of communism are already you know, firmly entrenched in uh, our governmental system. So for those of you that think that we're living in a free market or even mostly capitalist society and economy anymore are uh, really out of touch. Um, and this is how you get uh, governments like uh, or companies like Amazon able to do it. Whenever you allow the government massive intervention into society, you create a two-tiered society. One of them is the ruling class with access to the politicians, and one of them is you, just the lowly peasant. We would like to have a completely free market and free society where everyone is treated equally, you can make your own decisions, and you don't have a ruler making the call for you. So you talk about national progression that the government will eventually uh, become corrupt, but you don't take into the laws that are actually uh, uh, making sure that corporations can donate to uh, uh, people running for elections. So that alone would prevent all the problems that you uh, care to say right now. And America is not mostly a socialist country. We are nowhere near. I would rather contend that we are a capitalist-dominated country. Yes, we do have uh, some programs here and there that, uh, that are socialist, like the fire station is socialist, the police is socialist, the public library is socialist. Given that you own all of these, uh, all of these institutions uh, without having to pay for them. So I would advocate for a similar system where, you, uh, uh, where people uh, don't necessarily have to buy in for healthcare and education, and you, you, go, off, uh, you go off of public funds, uh, funds to uh, fund those programs. As, aside from the fact that we do not have the public funds to fund those programs, uh, the fact is, is that the situation isn't magically fixed uh, once uh, you, know, you get all money out of politics. Uh, you know, we right now have a $1,000 cap on that you as an individual can give to a politician or even a corporation. But we have political action committees that uh, you, you, will have, you will have it no matter what. Nonprofits that will be formed in order to push a particular ideology such as YDSA, which I'm sure is a 501c3, so they're able to uh, do all of those things. But the fact is, is that if you give the government control, somebody is eventually going to try to skew that control in their favor. If it's not a corporation in a corporatist society, then you will have true socialism or communism, where, let me ask you how badly Maduro and his friends are eating right now in Venezuela. The rest of the Venezuelans are on the Maduro diet, but that guy is, uh, wasn't it Salt Bay that made him a steak when he went to Europe or something? Guy that doesn't, I don't know, I'm not up with meme culture the way you guys are. So, but... Uh, <laughs> The fact is, is that every time that you have seen socialism instituted, uh, whether it's 
a country going completely socialist or just a minor government intervention into the market. The market has always gotten worse. First of all, uh, me personally, I would not support the government just handing out checks to people. I would rather make sure that people have the uh, proper infrastructure in place to be able to earn that money. So I'm all against giving people blank checks. So if you have a healthcare system and an education system, I think that takes care of uh, a, a public healthcare and education system. That takes care of the progress that an individual can achieve on his own without getting a universal basic income. Uh, I'm personally, personally opposed to the universal basic income uh, for a multitude of reasons. Uh, number one, I'm opposed to it because, uh, congratulations, rent prices just went up $1,000 in your area if we uh, institute a $1,000 UBI. Um, but I'm even opposed to it as a replacement for all of the current welfare systems that we currently have. Because the problem is, is our system is overly bloated and needs to be pared down. It will bankrupt us if we don't do it right now. Right now, we are enjoying a standard of living on our grandchildren and great-grandchildren's dollars. We already are experiencing that millennials are the first American generation in decades that will have a lower standard of living compared to the world than their parents had. This is what happens when you have the greatest generation suddenly become the greediest generation. And if millennials become the greediest generation yet, then you are going to have grandchildren and great-grandchildren who are not living the same standard of living. The UBI is a bad idea because once you get a guaranteed amount of money sent to you every month, you'll notice when that amount drops or stops rising, and that will make paring down the welfare system impossible. Our next question is from another very popular topic around the economy right now, and that one has to do with the question of our artificial intelligence and what that means for the economy going forward. Um, when artificial intelligence takes existing human jobs, are there going to be new types of jobs being created, or will we face mass unemployment? And here, you can that. Back to the time that uh, we first uh, introduced uh, John Deere tractors into the farm fields, there's been concern about whether or not we were going to have massive unemployment because all of the seasonal farm workers wouldn't have uh, uh, anything to do anymore. Um, it's what's known as the Luddite fallacy. And the fact is, is that every time uh, technology improves in order to make our lives more efficient, that's people then that don't have to waste their time doing that. Does anyone want to uh, you know, have the job of doing the role of a calculator? Or is that a complete waste of your time, complete inefficiency, and you want to go get a job doing something else? So the whole point is that whenever technology replaces your job, that means that you can go provide even more benefit to somebody else uh, in the economy and to yourself. Well, surprisingly enough, I have to agree with Garrett on this. I don't think you need human cashiers anymore. Uh, it, uh, it does bring up the question that will people uh, lose their jobs? They might. But, I, uh, but what I envision is that you will, uh, more meaningful jobs will be created. Uh, humans will be left to pursue artistic end endeavors instead of having to you know, slave away at a corporation in a, in a job that doesn't require any skill. So as a business student and a future uh, employee of a corporation, I can see from this perspective as to why artificial intelligence might be good that it would basically, you know, give you more freedom and give you more time to pursue meaningful things than rather just wasting your time away at a job. Uh, 
This question goes to uh, the issue of innovation in our economy, uh, something that AI also deals with. Uh, this person asks, the application industry, that is Snapchat, Instagram, Uber, is now a $3 trillion a year industry, something that wasn't even thought of 20 years ago. How are industries like this capable of being created in a socialist economy where incentives are for profit are removed or substantially reduced? Well, I, would, I wouldn't say that uh, incentives and profits are removed in a socialist economy. You would be able to create Instagram and Facebook, but you know what would be more uh, advantageous in the socialist uh, economy? The, these giant corporations wouldn't have the power to squash away new competition. So if you, if you want to start an Amazon in today's climate, you can try, but Amazon will sure as hell use all of its power to squash you down. That wouldn't happen in a socialist uh, economy. So in that way, a socialist country is more freer than a capitalist society where uh, large corporations have an imaginable amount of power. Not entirely sure you understand that properly. Um, it, it, in, an, in a socialist uh, country, you're not getting Amazon off the ground, uh, plain and simple. Um, the only reason you that wouldn't scale it that big, but you would surely get it off the ground. The, the only reason that uh, IKEA is still in Sweden is that it was created before the country went massively socialist in the 70s, and then they ended up actually fleeing the country in the uh, 80s when it got really bad. Um, the fact is, is that free markets are what the answer is to that. Um, understand that capitalism isn't necessarily the same thing as free markets. Capitalism is merely a private ownership of the means of production. Well, that also happens in a fascist state, where the state simply tells you what uh, to do. Uh, private prisons are a perfect example of something that fits under a capitalist model. There's nothing free market about them. That is why we vehemently oppose private prisons, just the same way that we oppose the ability of Amazon and other giant corporations like Ford and Chevy and GMC when they tried to crush Tesla when Tesla came out. The only way that they can do that is because the government has the power to pass regulations that can make it bad for Tesla, and Chevy and Ford and GMC can go lobby the government to pass those regulations to protect them. If you remove the government's power to be involved, you remove the big guys having that power to bully. Uh, this next question has to deal with the question of the global economy and how it impacts the worldwide. Um, this is specifically addressed towards Garrett. Um, you said that capitalism has brought a lot of the world out of poverty. Do you recognize the irreparable harms that capitalism has done in the third world countries that we piggyback off? Uh, I would say that that's not necessarily an issue with uh, free markets. That's more of an issue of whether or not people were, uh, nations were, were not conducting imperialism. Uh, I don't think anything about the free market is implied when you have uh, the United States government going over uh, to the Middle East and being so intervened uh, over the idea of the petrol dollar. The idea of the petrol dollar is all based in government necessity to be involved and government uh, necessity to maintain its playing field. Nothing about that is involved with the free market. And uh, BP and Chevron were surely not over in the Middle East conducting these wars. So I wouldn't say that, that it's anything uh, specifically against the corporations. Uh, and the fact is, is that, yes, uh, the countries that have freer economic scores than the United States their standard of living is growing faster. The five poorest countries uh, in the world right now are all in Africa, and all of them have absolutely deplorable economic freedom scores. The freer a uh, country is economically, the richer its uh, people are going to be. Do you guys remember that uh, Chinese workers in Apple factories were jumping off the buildings because they couldn't tolerate the amount of pressure that, were, that they were put into, the amount of work that was needed from them. So what was Apple's response to that? They put out safety nets around the buildings so that the people who wanted to die couldn't even die. That's capitalism for you. Capitalism has its roots in, uh, in slave uh, labor, and capitalism actually relies on its exploitation of workers to make the most profit. The, the formula is simple. Less input gives you more profit, so that means that you put, the, uh, uh, that you put an 
a huge amount of pressure on your workers for, for their output. The, the wage contract that's there, it's for the number of hours that you work there and the fixed salary. It doesn't take into, the, uh, uh, it, it doesn't take into account the number of uh, the effort that you put into your work, actually. And capitalism is uh, frankly incapable of doing that. If it cared about externalities like human, uh, uh, human rights and uh, the effect that it has on the environment, then it, wouldn't sim it simply wouldn't make profit. It simply wouldn't exist. That's why we are vehemently opposed to this, uh, uh, the whole system of capitalism. If I can have a uh, comment on that really quick. Uh, you were pointing to Apple as uh, you know, a company that you would point to as capitalist because it's based here in America. But you were pointing out in China, which is a communist country, and so the capitalist corporation needs to conform to communist standards in that. So I would argue that it's the communist system in China that's causing them to jump like crazy. Is and it the communist system that actually uh, uh, made sure that these workers couldn't handle the work? Is it the communist system that uh, asked Apple to... Uh, work these people for 18 hours a day? Is it, did they get like a, a notification Appar from apparently the, the of China? Apparently the Is communist that what happened? Apparently the communist government of China was willing to allow it. But the idea that people don't have uh, any other interests other than the profit motive is just not true. One of the big things about global warming is the reason why the solution is to uh, improve people's standard of living is once people reach a standard of living that is approximately $9,900 a year U.S., they magically start caring about the environment and they start making choices that are based upon what's best for the environment, not just what gets them the most stuff for the cheapest price. So the fact is, is that other people in the world do care about these things. It's not just people who wear a YDSA pin around. We actually do care about the environment. We actually do care about people being uh, better and healthy. We just are able to look at worldwide and historical statistics and see that communism kills people, capitalism makes them rich. So what is so are you saying that? Uh, are you done? Cool. So are you saying that a corporation is willing to lose money when it uh, has to defend the environment? A corporation is willing to lose money when it has to uh, uh, defend human rights? That is not the case at all. And if you uh, talk about communist China, then I, I wouldn't agree that that's a model that we are going to follow. And you say that. Uh, people actually do care about the environment and the human rights. If, if that was actually the case, then I wouldn't need to be here. Okay, next question. I just disappeared from my screen. Do you remember? Yep. yep. <clears throat> so, you made the argument that uh, transition to a socialist society would necessarily require the government to take a larger role in the economy, uh, and that would include uh, seizing businesses, seizing property and ownership of businesses or the means of production. This person would like to know exactly how will this occur in a society built on law and rule of law, uh, and in a society that's highly individualistic like our own. Right. So first of all, I would like to clarify that I do not advocate for a society where the means of production are taken over. DSA is a multi-tendency organization where you can you know, hold different views as to how you want to achieve that. And I'm more of a, uh, I, I support programs that would uh, take care of the essentials like healthcare, education, food, housing, and water, rather than getting into private uh, corporations. I would also like to make the case by saying that uh, in capitalism, like currently, um, uh, only eight percent of American workers are under uh, are registered with a union at all. So, uh, I would like to see workplaces become more democratic, where the workers have say over uh, the treatment that they get from their bosses. That would be my ideal uh, society where we move towards a democratic a democratic socialism. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's really simple that with uh, current private property laws, it wouldn't even be feasible. Um, but the bigger question is, is for those uh, YDSA members or socialists who do believe in seizing the, the means of production, uh, the argument is, is that, you know, the product of your labor is uh, what is, uh, you know, that you need to get the full value of it. Seizing the means of production is seizing the value of someone else's labor. The, those means of production don't just randomly spring into existence. Either the business owner or the people that he got the money from, they had to use their labor in order to have the money necessary to purchase that capital that serves as the means of production. So the idea that uh, 
you know, seizing the means of production to begin with is an idea that fails on its head, let alone in a uh, country that respects private property the way the U.S. does. Can I comment? Yeah, like a quick comment. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay. So it's very short-sighted from a historic perspective where you, uh, where you say that only capitalists could own the means of production. 200, 300 years ago, it was individual people who, who, who were craftsmen who could offer services uh, who, who actually owned the means of production. So for them to uh, get into a contract with a businessman and actually work for a set number of hours was only to supplement the actual income they were earning. So this was never a form of uh, a society where we had to depend on corporations to actually earn a living, to actually be able to afford food and housing. Last one. Did you want to make a comment? No, last oh. one. Last question. Uh, going on to our last question. Um, how would you go on to solve the housing crisis in America, particularly in places like New York City and San Francisco? <laughs> Uh, well, the first thing that you have to do specifically in those two cities uh, is abolish the rent control that they've put in place. Uh, all rent control do, does is uh, harm poor people by uh, uh, getting them stuck in places that end up becoming um, uh, it, it tinder boxes, essentially. Um, there's no incentive under a rent control system for uh, the people who own the buildings to upkeep them or modernize them. Uh, and so what you end up with is people who are locked into paying the same amount of rent every month, but the area around them gets nicer and their place stays the same or you know, dilapidates over time. Uh, so the, the answer is, is to actually open it up to the market because the market ends up solving everything. There is not a single industry water bottle that you guys are drinking out of, the clothes that you're wearing, the shoes and socks that you put on, on uh, today. For those of you that are wearing glasses, the market is able to make sure that you guys are able to get what you need and at a low price that you guys can afford in all of these things. This will also happen in housing if you just get the government out of it. I don't want the government setting a maximum price on Air Jordans. I don't want the government setting a maximum price on what I can pay for rent. Well, the way we would solve is rent control. That, I think that's the uh, way yeah, to go. Because, it. see, just because a landlord would throw a tantrum because he wasn't able to rise there, uh, uh, increase the prices of his rent and wouldn't maintain the building is on him. It's not the fault of the government that they needed affordable housing for their uh, community. And I believe that housing is a right. So if but you're- if, But if they already have rent control, that can't be your solution. What else? No, rent control, that they already the have argument it. against rent control. No, they already have it. New York, and, uh, New York and LA and Chicago all have massive rent control. That doesn't work, obviously. So uh, the... You just said <laughs> that! No. The devil, the devil is in the details. So when you talk about rent control, it's not just you uh, putting in a regulation that doesn't work for them. So you have to actually make sure that it's implemented in a way that, uh, that makes housing affordable. And when you talk about the choice in a, uh, the illusion of choice in a, f a free market system, I'll give you an example. So you go to buy a car, you'll be offered two to three different models. You, maybe you can buy a Ford or a Toyota in different colors. But the free market system doesn't give you the option to take the subway or the bus. That's why, the, uh, that's why government comes in and makes sure that you have actual diversity of choice and not just an illusion where it's driving you uh, to be an individual pur purchaser and uh, accumulate as many commodities as you can. I absolutely, ins I absolutely instead, of flying, uh, instead of driving to Chicago, can choose to take any number of uh, air carriers that I choose. But what can about choose to train? take Amtrak, and that is what about provided train? by the market. What, what about a train? Why, why is it not more interconnected than we have? The government stepped in for that. <laughs> We're doing closing statements? All right. Closing statements. All right. I, I'm going first on this one since you are. All right. Sounds good. So, uh, again, I'd like to thank Vinay, um, also our two moderators uh, who took time out of their day, uh, and all of you guys. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the pizza. Uh, I considered this debate one from the very start, that I got the socialists to pay for the pizza. But like all good socialists, they use somebody else's money to pay for it, so <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> but, I find it yeah, got it. <laughs>
Um, the main difference uh, about this, as I said at the beginning, is the question of we're, we're at, agreed that we need to elect uh, leaders. The question is, do you want them to remain solely leaders to protect your rights and your uh, ability to go around unmolested, or do you want them to be your ruler, making massive amounts of decision making for you? Uh, the argument for this is that we need rulers because some people just can't get by, you know, they can't uh, make the decision making for themselves. To say that is to admit then that you hope to elect rulers who are somehow better versions of humanity than all of the lowly peasants that they will uh, rule over. So my question is, where are we getting these angelic angels since, you know, who the socialists have chosen thus far has clearly not worked out? And even if you find this one benevolent dictator to make all of the beautiful calls for the uh, United States, what happens when that person dies and they're replaced with the orange man? First of all, uh, I think when you're defending a capitalistic system, I want you guys to think about who you're defending. You're not a capitalist. You're just a tool of the capitalist system. And unfortunately, so am I as an employer of a corporation. So the point that DSA, YDSA socialists come from is for the welfare of the society. We advocate for the welfare of the 99% of the people and not the people who are in control of the means of production. So I want you to think about, uh, about this after the debate in detail as to who, who your argument is really benefiting. And as to YDSA, I would like to say that uh, we're taking up a bunch of campaigns on campus I, whether you're a socialist or not, I'm sure that you don't like the quality of food that's being offered, offered in the dining halls. So we're going to make sure that we put pressure on the administration to internalize the uh, food supply system and uh, divest from Aramark, a company that uses pl uh, prison slave labor. We're also partnering with Fossil Free UC for a climate strike that's going to happen on Friday noon. We are, uh, we are demanding that the university divest from fossil fuel companies, coal industries. We believe that a university should not participate in the acceleration of climate change that threatens our very existence and disproportionately the existence of uh, millennials. And also we are working with the adjunct faculty uh, at uh, UC to make sure that there's a proper centralized system to take care of their needs. Currently the uh, faculty faces a lack of raises. They haven't seen a raise since 2003. Uh, they, have, uh, they have pay disparity which is no, not due to malintent, but due to proper lack of management. So if, if these are issues that you want to work on campus, then I urge you to join YDSA. And fuck capitalism. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. Please remember to pull out the survey, the post debate survey. This gives us very important feedback and data that we can use uh, for both groups. If you want to continue the discussion and speak to the, the debaters and amongst each other, we will be going to hopscotch immediately after the debate. And our great debate, that's our debate with all four political groups, will be April 9th. It's a Tuesday at 6 p.m. and will be in the Liter Center Auditorium. Hope to see you there. Uh,